I used to sit with my mom in the evening and uh, on Friday she would let me stay up late and would roast sweet potatoes over a coal fire. You're listening to Be There, Do That, the podcast featuring everyday stories about food, race, and social impact in Africa. I'm Yolanda Busby. Yeah. So it was beautiful. That was one of my favorite things that we used to do. And I remember now that we, I love mint tea. Like in the morning, I'll have my two espresso shots. When I finish, I'll have mint tea until probably around two o'clock. Mm. And every time that you, I had a stomach ache or I was bloated or I wasn't feeling well, she will pick mint and put it in water and make me drink that. She never gave me medicine. And years after that I study and I understand the chemical pathways or the, the, the properties in mint that actually heal your gut, that it takes you back and you realize that you come from a culture with a vast amount of nutritional knowledge. That was dietitian and author Impo Shikuru, who wrote a pretty unique and tasty book called Eat Ting. Ting is the Zulu language word for what I, and maybe you, know as fermented mabele, and that's sorghum in English. I've been a dietitian for almost 15 years, but more and more I'm leaning towards uh, food anthropology with an interest in African food. Now, in case you've never come across sorghum or ting, let me tell you a bit about both. Sorghum is the most resilient and prolific of ancient African grains grown and indigenous to the African continent. You have texts where, I think it's, it's in eating where we, Shaka Zulu's mother was saying, people shouldn't be given sorghum because if you give them sorghum, they're going to be very happy. And if they're happy, you can't control them. According to South Africa's Sorghum Trust, sorghum was cultivated in East Africa as long ago as the second half of the fourth millennium BC. And it's presumed to have been introduced into Asia in approximately 700 BC on account of the trade route between East Africa and India. So there's a lot of issues around it yeah i don't really exactly know what we what we what is the issue with with not promoting sorghum some of the people will say to me they see it as poverty food like i would say that my mother didn't buy conflict so she she gave me sorghum and the poverty mentality would be because we were poorer when i grow up and i live in the suburbs i would then buy myself that which my mother didn't buy me because i have more money yeah. And it's something that is in the stores and the stores are more lani in a way than where I come from. So you associate the food that you grew up with, with being poor. In her book, Eat Ting, Impo explains, as agreed also by author Tracy Ledger, who I chatted with in part one to this piece, it's Black South Africans more than any other who have been affected by urbanization, acculturation, and apartheid at the food table. Moving from rural to urban life resulted in the direct rejection of numerous varieties of indigenous wild greens, nuts, beans, millet, and sorghum. Uh huh. And what was that Biko said earlier? You know, in part one. There needs to be uh, an attempt at reorganizing the whole economic pattern and, and economic policies within this particular country. What is that route? There is a direct link. Uh, and while people around the world uh, previously were feeding sorghum to their field animals and using it as a staple crop to get the best performance out of their farm animals, humans have sort of decided this is not really a worthy grain. It's not really a worthy food. Meanwhile, this is one of the superfoods uh, and, and is most consumed on the continent. We actually going back to nature or to the old ways and learning from what the old people used to do. So to solve our nutrition problems, we need to actually treasure these old people and saying, tell us what you used to do. Yes, we have to modernize it or, you know, to make it much more relatable to the current um, economic climate. But the basics of how they survive is the answer to most of our solutions. Everybody's now going, oh, I am plant-based. 
But if you look at all peasant um, communities, if you look at even in African culture, killing a cow was not something that you would ordinarily do every week or even every month because you want to eat meat. An African looked at a cow in, as an investment, as my retirement policy. This will will sustain me and my family in many years to come because if I I keep it alive, it's going to give me milk, but it's going to give me more cows and the cows will have more cows and I'm going to be rich. Yes. We never ate meat for breakfast, lunch and supper like we did now. So it's nothing new with this whole plant-based um, diet. It's what our, our grandmothers did. Meat was eaten when a cow died or when a special occasion, not in big portions that we're doing now. So yeah. we should not be thinking that we are the ones with with the solution and, and, and we are more trendy. I just love what you've said. It's exactly where I, I, I breathe and sleep and eat. I'm right there. I so agree with you. Accepting and acknowledging that we are a part of that same system as opposed to being somehow outside of that system and entitled to just consume and consume and consume. So how do we go back? Reclaim that ancestral wisdom through food. Welcome, welcome aboard. Welcome, welcome, welcome aboard. Welcome, welcome, welcome aboard. Welcome, welcome. welcome I like aboard. speaking with older people and they always ask me what is wrong with me? Why am I interested in their boring stories about traditional foods? Because their children don't want to listen to any of their grandchildren, don't want to listen to any of the stories. And they say, we, so, we have so much knowledge that we want to impart, but our children think because we can't text then we can't use the new technology, we have nothing to teach them. And it's actually very sad. I started questioning what is functional nutrition in an African context. So I, at the same time, I also had my own health problems. Um, I found out that I had leaky gut and I was allergic to a whole lot of things like soya and tree nuts and gluten. Mm-hmm. And I was also questioning for myself that why, why this gluten allergy, what did our ancestors eat? So I started to find out that, you know, in, in Africa, our grains are millet and teff and sorghum and um, fonio. Mm-hmm. And we don't have wheat, we don't have um, uh, corn, like in South Africa, we are eating corn like it's our staple food. So in our country, you know, we have the history where the, the apartheid government just was subsidizing the farmers and at every cost, they wanted maize to be grown. We lost out on indigenous products, which are easy to grow. Then we forced things that are not meant for this area to grow here. And I think also as the people all over the world, we're losing out on diversity and of, of foods that we can eat and nutrients. Welcome, welcome, welcome aboard. Welcome, welcome, welcome aboard. Welcome, welcome, welcome aboard. Welcome, welcome, welcome aboard. We don't know now that we, the, all over the world, we're losing, we, we're facing problems with food shortage with the climate is turning up against us but we've lost so much so i started to do further research and found out that we actually have quite a lot of superfood in bracket because it's not a scientific word but we're not actually celebrating them that we can actually start promoting them and put them on par like the chinese are doing with their nutritional compounds that are actually used as medicine Mm. Remember I said earlier, I've got something of interest to share about using indigenous grain for economic development in part one? Well, here it comes. Are you hungry? Yes, I am. Are you hungry? Yes, I am. I was telling you a bit ago about this project, Mm -hmm. which has become a product. Uh, out of my business, Prosperity Food Company. And what I did was I took some high school kids, uh, about 40 kids on a journey to design a sustainable, uh, drought-resistant, nutritious, low GI, dense protein, snack-based product that they can eat uh, with one hand, which needs no um, electricity, no water, and no refrigeration. From guidance from me, these brilliant kids came together with an idea of actually a, a sorghum-based rusk. 
Okay, let's just take a step back for a moment. What exactly is a rusk? How to make rooibos tea and rusks. Rooibos rusks. Ru- ruib- uh. How to make rooibos rusks. Evita Seperon and Suzelle DIY are two of South Africa's more iconic Afrikaans female archetypes, although one is not actually a woman. The one plays the role of a kind of, you know, your auntie's auntie, and the other is a bit more of a Carol Burnett or Lucille Ball type character. But both represent modern and old-fashioned South African Afrikaans cultural reflections, and especially no, when it comes to cooking. Eight teaspoons well, okay, no, of we don't, we don't need this book. No, we it's my cookbook, Miss Gold. No, no, so nice, love it. But there's a different recipe. It's an indie. My own recipe from my head. You'll need butter, bacon, two eggs, a little lemon, milk, sugar, cream of tartar, in artilla kiso, the white flour, and finally, some rooibos. We're gonna start. By now, I'm sure you remember, I've been in South Africa for a bit over 20 years, and when I got here, I had never heard of a rusk, didn't know anything about a rusk, would never have eaten a rusk, and didn't know who or how a rusk was made, nothing. And it was not so long after that, I realized... Rusks are rather significant in a South African cultural context. So sure, you eat them, but they mean a lot more than just having a fun-filled snack. Look at us. United. Together at last. Dreamed about this day. Have you, Tani? Okay, getting back to sorghum and what has become trust rusks. Basically... I said to the kids now, in order to sell these things, in order to achieve these things within your peer, your small circle, the medium and the large circle of your concentric circles of peers, how are you going to get them to buy this? We need to create a value stream. And they came to the idea of trust. And I like the musical sound of it, Trust Rusks. (laughs) What I like with your idea is that you ask them to be part of the solution so they own it. It's the same same thing that I see when I work in my clinical practice with families or even with, with somebody who brings a child. If the child is involved in the preparation of the food, even from the gardening, if you say to me, my child doesn't eat vegetables and you start planting simple things like carrot and spinach, if they, they participate in the growing of the garden, and even if you don't have a garden that they go to the shops with you and you ask them to cut the carrot or peel the potatoes or participate in making the food, they're more likely to eat the vegetables because it's, they see that they, they have a hand in making that kind of food than if you just prepare the food and you say, eat is good for you. Yeah, absolutely. And you're teaching them a skill. And I, I felt like with something as basic as a trust rusk, for that to be said out loud, ongoing, instead of, I don't trust the government. I don't trust the water. I don't trust the electricity. I don't trust the neighbor. There is an enormous amount of goodwill and social trust that is in the market in South Africa, but we don't speak of it enough. So for me, having a product where you, I pass it to you and you say, oh, what's that? I say, it's a trust rusks. It's a perfect opener. They say, a what? Uh, it's a trust rusk. Oh, I have to trust you to, to buy it. Yeah. And you got to trust me to sell it. And, eh, eh, eh. you know, it allows for some playful engagement also. It is. That's why I, I tend to think that if we start this, this education and this revolution with the children, we, we, we will probably in the next 20 years have better, healthier um, um, citizens than we have now. Yeah. And I, I really, I, I see that again, and it's a part of the, uh, wanting to be collaborative in the same ways that bees are. Bees appreciate the diversity. Innovation specialist, investor, and entrepreneur Joshin Ragabar not only agrees with this, but he's crafted his whole career around this issue. So I... Um... I'm an entrepreneur in the work I do, both in businesses that are for-profit and businesses that are solely around impact. I'd like to think all our businesses have an impact lens, um, but but I work across, you know, the the line blurs to me across non-profit and profit in in the various areas I spend my time in, business areas I spend my time in, my energy in. And um, the the area where I said part of the the, the, the life cycle of business where I spent 
my time engaged in is in the creation uh, of businesses and getting them through the early stages uh, and then getting them set up for, for growth. So as an entrepreneur, I've been a serial founder of businesses. Um, and it's, it's something I, I get certainly get the most out of. And it's, I find it a very much a, a, being a, a creative expression uh, for, for me. I've always been a connector of, uh, between people and ideas. Um, I, uh, I, I like seeing the relationships between things, you know, there's a uh, kind of a often used term saying, uh, you know, you've got to be able to join the dots. And, and that's what I think entrepreneurs do. But before you can join the dots, I think uh, you, you've got to be able to collect the dots. And I think that's an often um, uh, forgotten part of the journey. So, you know, in order to, to join the dots, you first have to collect the dots. And collecting the dots is really just having a full life, like we talked about earlier, you know, being able to, to get engaged with different ideas, meet different people, really get, pay attention to, to different uh, parts of life and, and different ideas. Um, and more importantly, I think it's to build genuine uh, um, relationships, you know, relationships based on, the, uh, uh, on trust. How do you find that trust? I mean, I, I've been thinking a lot about the concept of social trust and in fact, how subtle it is and how often people take it for granted, don't consider it as a currency at all, but how in fact we all engage and exchange social trust from the moment we step out of the bed until the evening yeah. when we get back into the bed. Yeah. I, I, I so, um it's a theme that certainly permeates my, my life and an idea I think about uh, a lot um, for a number of reasons. First of all, you know, I think if you just pay some attention and look and scan or scan uh, across the world, um, successful societies are high trust societies. Successful businesses have high trust cultures. Successful relationships are high trust relationships, right? So, so, and that's probably one of the, the, the few, if maybe the only common denominator across success, across different communities across the world and different types of relationships. So trust must, must be something we, we think about a lot and we should find, actively find ways to, to, to build trust and to grow trust, right? So social trust is, is, is an idea that um, we should pay conscious attention to rather than be passive recipients of. So that's been a, um, a theme in my first business I built was a relationship marketing business, right? And we built a business where we uh, would help our clients build stronger relationships with their customers in order to generate um, long-term uh, commercial sustainability. You know, I've been looking at, at this in relationship to a product that I've developed in my business, which is called Trust Rusks. And basically what I did was I took uh, some teenagers and some tertiary students on a journey, which is sort of a light design thinking uh, eight month journey, which basically I presented them with uh, an indigenous African grain and told them that out of this process, we would come to designing a snack-based product that could be eaten with one hand, requiring no refrigeration, no electricity, and no water, uh, and that it would be traded at a peer-to-peer -peer level, not a retail basis and not a multi-level marketing scheme. Now, at the essence of that, you know, to say, okay, we're going to be creating and engaging microeconomies at this level, the very first thing that we had to do was establish a rubric of values and the values around what is a community and then within a community who are the players who are influencers and then who is it who can suggest influence produce provide distribute a product that as you've just discussed could be trusted and is it conveniently 
uh, you know, received? Is it something that people, as you've just discussed, have to go out of their way to be able to get? And again, would you go out of your way to get something from an individual or from a retailer or a brand that does not have embedded within its values, trust? And it was really interesting to me to find how these young people um, really hadn't given it any thought whatsoever. And it's kind of ironic, you know, how we are all so easily enveloped in social media, which doesn't, as you again just described, doesn't really require anything from us. Click, link, Mm -hmm. give me your email address. Um, But we place so much existential value in this thing. Um, meanwhile, you know, you get on or off a taxi in any urban environment, uh, you, uh, a bit more of an upmarket consumer pop in and out of any cafe and sit down and order and complete a meal before any cash is exchanged. And we take for granted the wealth of social currency that we've exchanged and therefore very much like the collective consciousness of a hive mind of sorts that we just kind of fall into it. It's a part of our nature. There is the value of social trust at the center of each of the projects that you've done. So can you tell me something about one that actually helped you as an individual grow more social trust than you thought you needed? The first example is that we have a business um, called Explore Sideways, which is a luxury travel business around providing experiences around wine, food, uh, culture, um, and some active experiences. And um, one of our biggest insights in building this business, we saw an opportunity in underserved market uh, in connecting high-end travelers to independent specialist guides and in delivering a highly curated experience that would bring joy and through growth and discovery. But what we didn't pick up right at the beginning and became it's become probably the, one of the biggest um, areas you work on and, and pillars in our business is this idea of trust. When you travel somewhere, particularly to another country, you are trusting someone with three or four days you may have somewhere. And you're trusting a whole bunch of people that you never met. Um, so trust becomes everything. And it's not value for, at, at a, for, for money at a particular market segment, but it's certainly value for time. Right? You want to get the most out of that experience. And secondly, we were working with guides who, until we, when we started working with them, they had been a community that, as independent guides, that had been um, quite badly treated. So they would never get paid on time. Uh, they would get poor payment terms. So when we started the business, we realized a couple of things. One is that we had to build customer trust. People had to trust that we would deliver, our, we would shop, our guides would shop when they needed to show up. Uh, we needed to get be paid up, paid up front, which was a big deal. With our guides, they needed to prove that we could, we would pay them on time every time and we'd pay them well. So, and it's grown a space where now there's trust in an industry, in, in the guiding industry where there wasn't one before. You know, over five years, it's become the norm across the industry. And it just shows we're doing the little things right paying on time, treating them well, um, and, and paying them well. The, the second component of where trust has played a massive role in organization, to work at the intersection of these societies, to create interventions that will grow an ecosystem of vibrant companies and, P and talent that support those companies. Um, and so everything we do, it comes down to how successful we are at being a convening power that people trust. The mm. government trusts, the business trusts, that society trusts. So we actively work at that. I'm now moving it to a conversation of race and culture. Do you think it's as easy for that sort of diversity to take hold with that kind of success? Or does it actually also require a little bit of a monocultural, monoracial context? I hesitate to say we trust people that look like us, uh, or we only trust people that look like us, right? But I do think I do think we are tribal in nature as people, and we so we tend to trust people, uh, unfortunately, that either look like us. If we don't have any other um, criteria or landing point, right? Mm. You know, um, 
the marker is, is this person like me? Right? And that can be race. Frankly, I think at, at societies that, that don't evolve other criteria points, that'll, it might be the only thing. Right? But I, I don't believe that's the human kind of end point. That's, I think we, we can evolve much higher than that mm. and much more than that. I uh, have greater hopes for, for humankind than, uh, than not being able to see beyond race. Isn't that amazing how many of us have that greater hope and belief? And it's, it's very inspiring because um, I think far too often people get stuck, and this is looking from an outside perspective. Um, I think people get stuck at this concept and this idea of what an African is, what an African can do, what an African's exposure and experiences are, and then, of course, subsequently find themselves, you know, sort of in shock and awe at the successes and the innovations and the shifting of global consciousness that comes out of an African context. Uh, and I think it's exactly just as you said, you know, this going back to the beginning of our chat, this idea and understanding of the connectedness within a natural world and that from that space, all other ecosystems evolve is something that to me is still a very um, valuable luxury that we have in an African context. And it's something that continues to demonstrate. In South Africa or anywhere in the continent, if we want to grow a, a, a successful society um, that, that not only uh, is, grow, is, is growing, but it's also inclusive and brings people along with it, with them, we, we have to work at improving the trust coefficient. And I think, you know, as we sort of look into exporting a deeper understanding of social trust, much beyond this idea of Ubuntu, to have the ability to articulate it, just as you've explained, where you can see in a young person, they get it. They get it because they've embodied it. Um, that's, that's magic. I mean, that's extraordinary. I mean, you're totally right, you know. I've, oh, I've I love it when I get that direct sign. It's time to cue the bee. Enjoy what you've just heard? Keep listening. And while you're at it, why not share it with a friend? The best is yet to come. This podcast is brought to you by Prosperity Food Company, makers of Trust Rusks and Be Grateful Ice Teas, along with other fantastic indigenously African snacks. Edited by Daryl Boy with sound design by Melanie Robertson of Origin Audio. Thanks for listening. I'm Yolanda Busby. Thank you.